So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, give this um, this talk. Uh, as Mike said, I'm Eli Lazar. I'm a PhD student at the University of Hertfordshire. And uh, obviously, for those who don't know uh, my background, um, over the past couple of years, my focus, um, my research area was to do with um, galaxy evolution studies uh, from morphological perspective, especially in the uh, looking at dwarf galaxies. Um, the other chunk, uh, significant chunk of my PhD was to do with developing big data tools that will help us analyze even the low surface objects that will become um, available and more and more available in millions with services like Euclid and uh, LSST. Um, today, I'd like to share with you some recent results on the morphological mix of dwarf galaxies in the nearby universe. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, most um, uh, important, uh, some important collaborators which we have had to uh, to work with me on this uh, are from universities of uh, Hertfordshire, Nottingham, and uh, Victoria. Um, and before I start, I to briefly introduce why morphology is an important uh, way of looking at galaxy evolution. So morphology, as we all may know, is actually a key trace of galaxy evolution. It's characterized by the small and large script processes that act on or within its uh, structure. Um, these are of, uh, these types of processes are of the, um, two types, um, internal usually, such as different types of uh, binary feedback, third bar, or spiral dynamics, or external, such as um, different types of merger events, ground pressure stripping, or different types of gas depletion or uh, accretion events that happen between the galaxies. So there are many studies out there, um, piled up across the um, literature in the last decades that uh, point towards the fact that there is indeed a strong correlation between these types of processes and the formation and evolution of um, the um, Hubble types that we know. From the most um, centrally light most driven and uh, dispersion dominated systems such as early type galaxies, the most disky star forming rotation dominated uh, systems such as late type galaxies. And if we look close in the literature, we can see that we can uh, segregate in a very nice way between these types of galaxies using just, uh, just oh, okay, I can use a stick, okay. Using just photometry and uh, properties derived from photometry, such as, um, such as uh, star formation rate, mass diagrams, and color magnitude diagrams. And here I'm showing some examples in two different environments, cluster top, and field galaxies in the bottom using two different data sets, SDSS and data from the coma supercluster. And what I want to, uh, main, the main idea here is that uh, we see that star forming, these galaxies basically reside in the blue cloud and they basically reside in the outskirts of clusters in low density environments where they're basically able to keep their gas and maintain star formation as opposed to um, the red spheroids uh, which are basically seen in the rate sequence. Um, and their uh, quenched uh, state is mainly due to them due to, as a result of different margin and gas depletion events that have happened across their like histories. Um, and of course, there are some exceptions to this rule when we um, take into account um, uh, dwarf blue, uh, dwarf blue ellipticals and massive red spirals, which actually do not fall uh, in this category, in this segregation, uh, and which I'll be talking about across uh, throughout my presentation. Uh, so what are the main metrics of morphology uh, that we use in the literature uh, when we look at images? Uh, so here I want to bring a discussion some normal proper non-parametric methods, such as the concentration asymmetry uh, smoothness system, M20 and G, um, which will also be the basis of uh, detailed structure analysis of my the paper that I'll be presenting today. Um, so here I'm actually uh, bringing discussions of the pioneering papers that actually um, 
brought these uh, parameters, which is the cost of the pattern entry, the lot style 2004. And um, what I want to guide the rotation to uh, in this uh, in this um, top plot, uh, the blaze of time, um, is that when we plot uh, galaxies in the uh, happiness concentration space, and when we look particularly at the uh, field circles, which look at early type galaxies and squares and uh, stars, which look at uh, late type galaxies, we can see that we can separate between the two of them, uh, two different populations, uh, with a criterion separation around here, where we see that the um, uh, late type galaxies uh, are around here, and um, early type galaxies are around there at um, high concentration and um, low clumpiness values. Uh, and when we look at the GM20 space, um, Lots of 2004 and lots of 2008, they have come up with um, other criteria for separating between normal main sequence galaxies and um, interacting galaxies, but also between uh, early types and later galaxies. Um, there are, of course, other um, methods of uh, distinguishing between these early types and later types, such as first secreting or by means of uh, virtual visual inspection. Uh, could be done by, of course, by professional astronomers or um, via um, large scale projects, projects such as Galaxy Zoo. And of course, um, other more automated methods are machine learning. And one of the most um, uh, popular methods of gaining traction in the last um, years, the last decade, is supervised machine learning via convolution neural networks. And of course, some method which does not actually require a label training set to separate between these galaxies um, is unsupervised machine learning. And that's the area of machine learning which I'm uh, currently also involved in, I'm working on. Uh, so, okay. Um, so what do we know so far in terms of galaxy evolution studies for especially for the intermediate mass and high mass regimes. Um, so for late type galaxies, we know that they are mainly dominated by signal evolution. Um, they uh, and this can be of two types. Uh, this can be slow external evolution, such as um, slow accretion of gas, mainly, or slow internal evolution, um, mainly done through the redistribution of material due to exchange of angular momentum. Um, between different structures within the galaxy, such as bars or spirals. We can also have um, different types of parallel feedback, such as stellar feedback or AGM. Um, and what I want to uh, mention here very briefly, I want to give an example of intrinsic sector evolution. And the most I, feel, I find that the most elegant example in the literature to do this is through uh, bars. So there are many studies out there that actually say that bars contribute in uh, galaxy quenching and bulge growth. And one study I want to mention me here is the study from Masters et al. 2011, um, which look at a sample of uh, thousands of these galaxies uh, from uh, galaxy Zoo 2, and they basically look at the bar, bar fraction versus, um, versus color, uh, where they basically see uh, that uh, the bar fraction for the uh, redder spirals, uh, the spirals which are redder, is actually higher than what, what you see in the blue, blue, counter, blue counterparts. Um, and when we split that plot in terms of bulge size, where uh, the smallest, uh, the smallest bulges, uh, the smallest uh, galaxies with the Spirals with the uh, with the smallest uh, with the smallest bulges are given by the uh, black line, and spirals uh, with the uh, biggest bulges are given by the red line. Um, we see that um, we get uh, we get um, uh, the uh, the bar fraction for uh, we get higher bar bar fractions for. Um, 
blue um, blue spirals uh, as well. Um, so which which can point towards the fact that due to the exchange of angular momentum, uh, as the bar forms and grows, um, it accretes uh, gas from the um, outskirts, outs outskirts of the galaxy towards the center of the galaxy. It forms, uh, um, it forms stars in the center. And once that um, once that uh, gas is depleted, it uh, the galaxy actually moves towards the red sequence of the diagram. Um, so um, to present one of the main uh, the main results for the early type galaxies that we've seen, uh, they basically are. Uh, the main driver for the morphological evolution is to is due to strong gravitational torques uh, caused by tidal interaction, uh, which basically gives rise to the quenching of star formation. Um, and this is mainly true for elliptical galaxies in the high mass regime and in this dense regions uh, of the cosmic web. Um, and some of the physical um, gas depletion processes uh, occurring are due to ram pressure stripping, starvation, or strangulation. And what are the signposts of this phenomena? Well, they are basically uh, all the tidal features that we see around them, such as uh, tidal tails, shells, uh, cellular streams, or kinematic integrally coupled cores. And here I'm showing two examples of um, galaxies which have uh, tidal features uh, from SSS 552, uh, where uh, I'm showing um, a galaxy with uh, a shell, a galaxy with a uh, tidal feature, a uh, tidal tail. Um, so, of course, what I've showed so far are results basically uh, made through the uh, analysis of high mass and intermediate uh, mass uh, galaxies. Uh, and mostly what we know about, about galaxy evolution is due to um, uh, these galaxies, uh, mainly because they are brighter, they're easy, easier to observe. But that's in contradiction with what, what we see, obviously, in the dwarf fishing, with, where these kind of galaxies are actually harder to see because they're just fainter. Uh, the problem here is that the dwarf regime actually dominates uh, the galaxy number density across uh, all environments across cosmological times um, in terms of uh, number. So they actually are uh, studying dwarf galaxies actually critical to understand galaxy evolution. Um, and the one thing I want to point out here is that uh, the morphological diversity of galaxies actually increases as you go down in mass. When we go from the uh, most centrally light concentrated um, dwarf elliptical galaxies to the um, uh, rotation dominated systems, uh, dwarf uh, late type galaxies to the irregular ones, to the faintest regime of the dwarf, dwarfs, uh, dwarf spheroidals, um, ultra diffuse galaxies. There are, of course, many other types such as blue compact dwarfs, ultra faint dwarfs. Um, so what do all these galaxies have in common? Uh, they are all uh, they all have low low mass, and they all have, which means that they all have shallow potential worlds. That means that they are basically highly susceptible to morphological transformation uh, due to internal or external processes. Um, so there are of course various studies of dwarf galaxies in the lo local group uh, or very local universe. Uh, but of course, um, due to observational biases, not so much outside of this region, this, these regions. And uh, the main evolution pathways uh, for the different morphologies of dwarfs is actually a, is quite actually not that well understood uh, due to the lack of statistical and unbiased results. And that's the reason for that is mainly because dwarfs in shallow surface like um, SDSS are actually uh, biased towards um, uh, anomalously high star formation rates, which may be, which may, uh, the reason, uh, 
And because of that, it may be difficult to obtain unbiased results when studying blood morphologies in surveys like SDSS. Um, so to the right, I'm I'm showing um, I'm showing completeness levels for different um, uh, surveys, uh, which obviously have different depths. So uh, here I'm showing uh, in red, I'm showing the completeness level for the SDSS, uh, in yellow for DESI, in blue for HSC white, and in black for HSC ultra deep. And one thing I want to mention, we calculated these completeness, completeness levels by um, um, by considering a cell population uh, which was born at the age of about uh, two, which uh, we then evolved this this ratio and uh, for a variety we calculated for a variety of cell masses, then we match that population with the depths of the surveys. So these computer levels, uh, what what they mean is that you can basically uh, observe uh, your galaxy sample that's the right of these levels uh, will be actually complete in terms of color. Uh, so if you measure, if you look at the galaxy population with SDSS, let's say in the dwarf region in this area, um, then you will be uh, biased towards uh, the blue dwarfs. Uh, but if you look uh, in that population with surveys like uh, HSC ultra deep, which is about 10 magnitudes um, deeper than SDSS, you can uh, resolve and detect all of the dwarfs um, in terms of cars. So you would not get any bias uh, results. And we can do that at the look up until a ratio of uh, 0.3 and down to masses of uh, 10 to the 8, so masses of surveys like HSC ultra deep. Um, so the study I'm gonna I'm going to talk today um, is to do with um, with the with dwarf morphology dwarf morphologies obviously uh, it's also published in uh, Lazarus in 2024 like just a couple of weeks ago from the first unbiased dwarf morphological studies outside the Verilog universe uh, we did this study using the Cosmos field that's about um, 1.5 degrees square fields with uh, deep HSC observations, um, which have a depth of, uh, comparable to what we will obtain with um, um, LSSD pair uh, imaging uh, with a PS of 0.7. We combine this imaging with accurate properties from uh, Weaver et al. 2021, which calculates uh, the properties from uh, about 40 bands. Uh, from near infrared to near ultraviolet. Uh, we restrict our sample just because we do visual inspection on this. Sample. We restrict uh, our sample to ratios more than 0 0.08 and masses between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 9.5. Uh, we don't go smaller than with mass, uh, lower in mass than 10 to the 8 just because uh, the errors uh, of physical properties such as the masses and stuff from which this may. Uh, increase considerably. And we use this redshift uh, cut mainly because of resolution effects. So after redshift of 0.1, you can't really resolve that easily the structure of dwarfs. Uh, so we end up with a sample of about, about 260 uh, dwarfs. And um, here I'm showing some examples uh, of the main morphological uh, types that we found. We found about that 43 percent of our sample is populated by dwarf poly types, 45 by dwarf lay types, and a 10 percent minority percentage uh, by dwarf featureless. Uh, the reason why we call that uh, minority dwarf featureless and not um, maybe dwarf surrenders or ultra diffuse galaxies, since their um, their diffuse morphology and lack of central light concentration may point towards that kind of morphology. Uh, the reason why we don't do that is because all the diffuse galaxies usually reside in uh, at, uh, lower effective surface brightnesses. So, uh, 
So uh, yes, the law reflects the what was said in the literature. So to the right of these images, I'm also showing an unshared mass on of the uh, an unshared mass version of this uh, of of these galaxies. This is to show how important unshared masking is when you do visual inspection, because then you can actually see all the um, spiral arms, bars, and all the structure within these galaxies. Um, so we also get, um, uh, we also find uh, dwarf irregulars in a percentage of about 2% in our sample. But just because the sample was too small, we excluded it from our analysis. Um, so the first thing that we do is actually just look at the images, see uh, are there any tidal tails around them, are there any tidal features? So we looked at, we observed that the interactions, the interaction fraction, interaction fractions in dwarf uh, later galaxies is actually a factor of two higher than uh, in the high mass region. And we suggest that a possible reason for that is um, to do uh, with the fact that these cars actually have lower and shallower potential wells than uh, uh, massive late of galaxies. And, and so their uh, matter is easily to redistribute within the galaxy with the feedback of other processes. Uh, and uh, the most interesting thing, I think, uh, is that we actually uh, find that the interaction fractions in dwarf polytype galaxies is actually a factor of five lower than in the high mass region. Uh, and that in combination with the fact that uh, only one dwarf polytype galaxy actually, in one in only one dwarf polytype we see dust lanes, where dust lanes are known as signposts of merger activity in massive polytypes. We tend to conclude that um, the evolution of dwarf early type has actually less to do with interactions and more to do with acyclic repetition uh, events. Um, and uh, dwarf uh, featureless types, we only see about, uh, for the interaction fraction for dwarf uh, featureless is about 20%. Uh, uh, 20%. Um, and I'll talk more about that in the next slide. Uh, for the um, local densities. So the next thing that we did was actually look at the environment. Uh, here we plot um, the different morphological types. So just for reference, uh, I'll be that I'll be using throughout, throughout this presentation. Uh, magenta is for door poly types. Uh, cyan is for door plate types, and green is for door featureless. Uh, here I plot the distance to the nearest massive, the first nearest massive neighbor the distance to the third nearest massive neighbor um, for these different morphological types. Uh, and one thing I want to mention is that uh, the cosmosphere is actually deemed to be a low density environment in the literature. So we are actually interested more in the differences in the uh, relative distances to the nearest massive uh, neighbor. And we don't see any uh, strong differences between the different uh, distributions. Uh, they all kind of overlap the medians and the uh, the dash lines. These medians basically all kind of overlap in this phase. There is a slight signal that dwarf featureless uh, are actually closer to uh, massive companions, but we need to test that using more uh, statistical samples. Um, for the rest frame, um, for the for the continuation of this uh, of this talk, I'm going to look more in more detail of the breast frame color of this object. So we find that about sixty percent of the dwarf polytypes galaxies are actually blue, which is of course in significant contradiction with what we find the massive counterparts and uh, the massive counterparts. And when we look in the uh, breast frame color uh, and mass space. And when we have approach simple simple populations with look back times of two, four, and ten years, we notice that um, this uh, this uh, blue uh, ellipticals are likely to have had star formation activity in the last uh, four years. Um, now talking about the uh, general population of tours, we only see that uh, about eight percent of the of of dwarfs are actually consistent with uh, monolithic formation of uh, which lie basically above the Tengigarian track. 
Um, for um, the door pixel types, we um, notice uh, for them like the median mass of about 38 solar masses, so they lie at the um, lower end of our sample. Um, and of course, from my last, my last slides, we notice the low instance of tidal, tidal features. Uh, given the fact that these objects uh, have shallow potential wells, we don't see many tidal features around them. Uh, we suggest that a possible uh, way for them to come to their diffuse uh, non centrally like concentrated uh, morphology is to do with more with stellar feedback in internal processes that tend to um, tidal interactions. Um, so, for um, looking now in more detail at the bar fraction in dwarfs, well, uh, about 11% of our uh, dwarf late type galaxies, which we have looked at in uh, phase one systems, actually have strong bars. Uh, and that's actually lower than what we find the Kaimas regime, which is about 20%. Um, when we look at the um, uh, color distribution for the barred and unbarred galaxies, we see that there is actually no color segregation. And if you remember what I talked uh, in my previous slide, in the introduction, uh, there was actually quite, um, quite a separation between these two uh, this, this, this distributions. Well, here we do not actually see. So uh, we suggest that uh, because of that, uh, bars may have less to do with uh, quenching in dwarfs, uh, dwarf galaxies. Um, so for the next part of my talk, I'm gonna look in more detail at the structural parameters, um, such as clumpiness, concentration, uh, symmetry, uh, M20 and G. Uh, and here I'm basically plotting the scatter plot, uh, my sample, and I'm comparing uh, my dwarf sample with uh, high mass galaxies from uh, from the from this a uh, dark energy survey, where the uh, contours, uh, the yellow contours of the massive late type galaxies, and the black contours of the massive uh, early type galaxies, and well, the obvious thing which I want to show here is that even though you can distinguish between uh, early type galaxies and later galaxies, the high mass region very nicely when you look at the distributions and the medians of these dis distributions, when you look at the yellow and blacks here, or for clumpiness, for clumpiness, of course, when you look again uh, at the yellow and black, or in the M20 gene space, when you take into account the lots 2004. Uh, criterion distinguished between uh, um, high mass galaxies between these uh, types. Uh, we do not see that kind of behavior in uh, in dwarfs, where you can see that pretty much in any space you can see that distributions actually overlap. Uh, so it is quite challenging to separate between uh, dwarf polytypes and dwarf late types via additional techniques like, like this. Moreover, what is causing this kind of um, results is that dwarf volatile galaxies have uh, uh, lower concentrations uh, by a factor of about one point four than uh, dwarf uh, than massive volatile galaxies, which of course tells us about um, the main evolution channels that uh, dwarf volatile galaxies and massive volatile galaxies um, have and how they actually accumulate matter in their course. Um, um, in the next part, uh, in these plots, here we are trying to, um, to use the asymmetry parameters in an automated way of uh, distinguishing between interacting and non-interacting dwarfs. Um, and uh, here I'm plotting the distribution of uh, different asymmetries uh, for um, interacting, uh, which are the starred uh, morphologies and non-interacting, which are the non-starred ones. Um, and we see that the uh, the medians of the asymmetries of interacting um, dwarf polytypes 
and do a plate taps, they're actually uh, several uh, several factors larger than their actually non-interacting counterparts. Uh, so we see um, there is a slight way of separating between non-interacting and interacting counterparts, uh, but their main general distribution still overlap our portion. Um, and here uh, we I'm I'm looking at the interaction fraction versus the asymmetry lower limit, and we see that uh, here we are trying to to see that the uh, an asymmetry a low lower limit of about zero point zero five for uh, door early types um, and an asymmetry limit of about zero point zero eight for later classes. This could be thresholds for about fifty percent of interaction fraction uh, in this uh, in these groups. Um, so um, there could be um, a way of uh, telling, not that precisely, uh, how um, of constraining the interaction fraction of, of this doors. Of course, this can change with uh, services such as LSST or Euclid in terms of statistics. Um, so for my summary, I would like to, um, of course, highlight the more than uh, the results of this paper is that um, one of the oh, one of one point I want to make is that we find evidence for differences in photometric and structural properties between dwarf and massive regimes. When we look at the dwarf theta galaxies, they are uh, possibly more susceptible to morphological transformation than uh, later galaxies due to their shallow potential wells. When we look at the dwarf polytype galaxies, um, we see that uh, their tidal interaction, uh, tidal interactions, actually factor of uh, tidal interaction fractions, is a factor of five lower than the massive polytype galaxies. Uh, Sixty percent of these are actually blue, and they are left to have had uh, star formation activity in the recent past. Uh, they are significantly less concentrated. And then the massive early type galaxies, uh, and they don't show that many uh, dazzling signs. So that can point and can suggest uh, a main evolution channels for dwarf early type galaxies dominated more by secular processes and less by interactions and models. Um, and we, of course, find um, that dwarf early types and dwarf late types. Uh, they uh, populate the cosmos field in uh, low, um, for low redshift, about uh, one to one proportion. Uh, and of course, you also have a minor, we will find a minority of about 10% of door featureless uh, galaxies, which are these objects uh, which resemble uh, door, door shredders and ultra diffuse galaxies because uh, they are not centrally constant, but they are also diffuse. Um, and we uh, we point out the fact that their evolution is likely to be driven by internal parameter feedback, uh, just because um, we find evidence that they're actually found in uh, low density environments, which is the field we're looking at. So, and uh, there is no relative local density differences between uh, the different dwarf morphologies. Um, and of course, when we look at the bars, uh, the lower there is a lower bar instance found, found for uh, dwarf later galaxies. So 11% uh, in the dwarf regime versus 20% uh, in the high mass regime. Uh, it is quite challenging to separate uh, dwarf late types from dwarf uh, early types classes using <laughs> popular non parametric techniques such as the PASS system, M20, and GD. And we are also trying to explore uh, to see if a symmetry can be used as an automated method um, to identify interacting dwarfs. Uh, so far, um, we don't manage to do that uh, uh, in an accurate way, but maybe it is possible to do it with higher resolution observations from uh, Euclid, for example. Uh, and do I have time for uh, some future work? Yeah. Um, so other current work 
um, I'm involved with is to do with um, agent fractions and dwarf scaling relations. And we are currently we are currently uh, looking at the sample of about uh, 19 dwarfs in the GST Cosmos survey, but the ratio is uh, about 0 0.4. And one interesting result that we find so far is that um, the incidence of aging in dwarf galaxies uh, via variability is uh, within less than a factor of two or smaller. And we know this has actually been a problem with literature for a, a long time. Uh, in relation to the fact that um, when looking at uh, trying to find AGN in dwarfs, so we're, we're actually finding evidence that AGN in dwarfs actually could be uh, possible. Um, so for future work, we want to uh, study obviously secular evolution through AGN uh, for the master regime and dwarf regime using uh, a wider area and deeper at the uh, Oh, yeah, wider area and at uh, larger depths using LSST, the LSST variability footprint. Um, and for my uh, dwarf scaling relations uh, study, we also look at the uh, effective set versus versus mass. We find a slight scaling relation uh, in this phase uh, with the dwarfs, uh, with the uh, dwarf frictionless. Uh, Residing in the uh, painter, painter's part of the of the in the lowest mass. Um, for um, some really interesting feature plans that we have in our uh, uh, in the uh, future is to do basically stuff, something like an atlas 3D for doors and look at the uh, uh, perform more some kinematic studies on on this sample. Um, so look at spectroscopic observations of uh, those for stellar codmen, but also for H1 gas, uh, where I'm focusing um, with the uh, H1 observations, the, uh, with your H1 observations, where we're interested in looking at the blue ellipticals that we actually found in our sample, just because uh, there are actually uh, evidence. It's interesting to see what kind of like uh, H1 uh, contents they have, mainly because we actually find three types of dwarf polytypes in our sample. Uh, the blue ones, the red ones, but also the ones which have blue cores and the red ones. So of course, it's kind of finding the connection between these uh, these types of dwarfs uh, could be uh, through kinematics, of course. Uh, could be an interesting way forward. Um, and um, the best way to, the best instrument to do this is to look with, uh, of course, IFU instruments, uh, such as the GARA, uh, which cover about um, 12 of second field of view, and look at also masses, more than 38 solar masses. Uh, and of course, we also want to draw the star formation histories, draw where we can see uh, mass assembly epochs and time scales. And uh, that, of course, will also be important for when we look at the dwarf featureless galaxies and dwarf uh, later galaxies. Um, and um, of course, in the next decade, uh, the data values will continue to, continue to grow to really large scales in terms of depth uh, and resolution. Uh, so we are expecting uh, basically uh, difference of a factor of, uh, of uh, the orders of magnitude between the data output of SDSS and service like Euclid and LSSC. So for that, we should be prepared with uh, techniques of uh, distinguishing between these different types of uh, these three different types of galaxies. And although Supervised machine learning is an important tool in making this kind of uh, segregation. Uh, unsupervised machine learning, which just does not actually need uh, label training sets, is also an important, uh, uh, significant, uh, an important way forward with this uh, endeavor. Uh, this is something I'm involved in, uh, involved in where, um, where I'm currently uh, 
developing uh, an unsupervised machine, way, machine learning way from the original code from uh, OpenNet Art 2018 and Mark Art 2020, where I'm basically uh, trying to scale uh, this code up to the data volumes that we're going to be receiving from LSSD and Euclid. And its feature space is basically uh, based on the power spectrum of uh, survey patches. Uh, these uh, are then kind of these feature vectors are then appended to a data matrix, which contains the initial feature space. This feature space is then reduced in size and uh, clustered together using different techniques. We, at the end of the process, we end up with about a couple of hundred morphological uh, clusters where each cluster represents, uh, contains galaxies of a certain morphological uh, certain with certain visual properties, such as uh, naked type galaxies, uh, clumpy disks, or uh, early type galaxies, or even other kind of objects that could be out there to it, such as stars. Uh, and the uh, of course in the in the near future we also want to look at what is the true morphological mix of dwarfs obviously uh, because now with um, data from um, a surveys like HSC wide Euclid or SNSSD will cover larger areas or at higher depths and we can uh, form a better idea of what is the morphological diversity of dwarfs in the local universe and beyond. Uh, and of course, we can look how uh, how this morphological mix changes with environments to us and how do the interaction fractions change. Uh, with uh, Euclid, uh, the interesting thing that uh, we can do is um, we can look at the, uh, the detailed analysis of uh, door structure uh, using uh, CAS and 20 g uh, This time, just because we have higher resolution, we can look into more details of the bar fractions that we see in doors and other structures, interesting structures, which we can see, obviously, at higher resolution in, this kind of, in these objects. Uh, and of course, um, when you use higher resolution surveys like Euclid, you can, um, there may be a possibility of constraining better tidal interactions uh, using in an automated way using the asymmetry parameter. And uh, of course, uh, an interesting thing to do is also to compare all these results with what you find in cosmological simulations, uh, where we can actually trace in detail the uh, evolutionary histories of, of these objects. Uh, and thank you for listening. This is all I have. Thank you, Alan, for that very nice talk. So uh, to kick off questions, I'm going to ask one from uh, Zoom to start. So uh, Johnny Pierce asks, do you take into account observational differences for the rates of interaction when comparing these work results to those for more massive galaxies? I mainly surface brightness sensitivity. Um, so there are actually, so there are, there is, there, there is a study out there uh, that's actually based on, uh, from Martin et al. 2021, which actually uses simulations um, to, um, to look and see if uh, tidal tails around uh, massive, uh, tidal tears around massive uh, galaxies are actually uh, easier to see than tidal tears around dwarf galaxies. And what they do, uh, they actually find that um, tidal tears are actually, um, uh, they, uh, they can be seen as well uh, for dwarf galaxies. But they could also be seen uh, in terms of the uh, flux percentages. So you basically see uh, the flux percentage that you see in tidal tails around massive galaxies is about, let's say, 80% that they find in this study. When they look at lower masses, uh, that flux percentage does drop uh, to 20%, 10% 
but these type of uh, uh, features can still be seen uh, can still be seen close to the, to the dwarfs, uh, but not as far out uh, in the uh, in angular scale. So you can still see this kind of tidal interactions in the dwarf class. I don't know if that answers it. Uh, yeah. Well, I can ask a variation on the same theme actually, but um, so the um, I like the idea of the um, the IFU the Atlas three D that we talked about. It's, it's, yeah. Um, could you say a little bit more? I've not heard of Mega 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 Aurora. Is it? Yeah, um, that's 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 an IFU actually like a, the a new instrument on the GTC in Canary Islands. Uh, has a resolution of about uh sparks a resolution of 0.6 r seconds uh field of view of 12 r seconds yeah. well the reason why we chose we think that we should use it this is actually it's easier to get time on it uh, yeah. <laughs> uh and actually the uh the field of view actually fits quite nicely to the uh, uh sizes of our dwarfs so it's yeah. Yeah, another another opportunity, another option would be would be weed. Um, yeah. So it looks like why did we love it? So the advantage you get there, okay, it's not on quite as big a telescope as um, GPC, but it has uh, a multiplex of twenty, so you get twenty of these things at the same time. And since your targets are all over the higher front end field, it's really well matched to the size of the field you're looking at. So there's, there might be some specific yeah. our moving to get. Sounds good. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so Cosmos field is quite small as far as I remember, yeah. and you have a redshift range or you know, narrow redshift range. So do you think that your results could be affected by the fact that you didn't probe um, enough environments? Yeah, that's yeah. definitely true. Uh, so Cosmos field is 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 thought to be a low density environment, so with your redshift of point one. So obviously, if you increase the redshift, you will also probe more environments. So, my you you could see that the fraction of, uh, the fraction of red, uh, early types might actually increase just because you see more, uh, uh like more clusters, more uh, uh high high based environments. But what the study was, what the study was supposed to show, is what kind of uh, studies we can do in the dwarf regime with the depth of uh, with the depth of uh, HSC uh, in the yeah. dwarf machine. Yeah. Uh, I have another one about the the, the unsupervised machine learning. I do not know those papers, unfortunately. So you said that there is a dimension reduction. So is it something like also encoders combined with some type of? Yeah. Uh, so uh, so. The there is a size the yeah, so there is a size reduction in the for the initial feature space, uh, and we use that we, we use that to uh, we use that uh, the technique for that is by using ground neural gas networks. Uh, I don't know if you heard of those. Uh, it's uh, where basically you find uh, clumps of uh, high density environments in in high density environments in your feature space. Uh, by it, it using an iterative iterative plus process, uh, and then clustering uh, will be done by the yeah, and then then the, the then the clustering will is actually done by a higher clustering that you do you do on that kind of uh, reduced space, and then the uh, then you use random forest classifier uh, to actually predict. Uh, all of the other uh, gases, uh, I mean, can be quite involved to explain.